is going to be talking about all of the things that can actually hold you back from property investing if they're done too early and opening up more of his success and how he managed to scale a portfolio so huge in such a short time frame. And a lot of it is because of the order that he went in. Some of these answers might surprise you. But right now, let's get into this episode with Simon Liu, because I know this is one that's not only going to get you thinking, but going to get you talking as well, hopefully in the right way to keep you growing your portfolio. Simon Liu, how are you, man? I'm good. How are you, Todd? I'm very good. Um, I'm personally very interested in this episode, mm -hmm. because I think that this is something where a lot of people unknowingly go wrong. Mm -hmm. And and I think it's one of those you don't know what you don't know type situations. Yeah. So I'm I'm yeah I'm I'm keen to get your perspective on I guess how this feels so big because it's like how life could play out differently for someone mm. if they just reshuffled the deck in the beginning, and if just in case someone's listening to this thinking well I can't reshuffle the deck in the beginning I'm I'm 30 now or I'm 40 or whatever it is mm -hmm. it's like yeah okay well we can still reshuffle from the point that you're at. Mm -hmm. But it's this order of wealth that's got my curiosity peaked quite high. So to kick it all off, can you actually answer the question, Simon? Like, why is the order so important? Well, wealth doesn't uh, happen overnight. Okay. You know, it takes, uh, especially when you're starting out, let's say you're, you know, uh, you're working your nine to five and, you know, you might be you know, in your mid-20s or mid-30s, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. To build wealth over time, you need to take it in stages. That's what I've I've noticed, right? Okay. So the first stage for me, because I started working nine to five very early on in my life, I, you know, all my mates went to uni and stuff like that. And I, I, I didn't because I didn't do well in high school. So I started working nine to five and that's when I realized, not because I was lazy or anything, but it, there's no goals, right? Like for me anyway, there's career goals and things like that. But, you know, you, you go through your, your job, you go home, you watch TV and spend the weekends going out with your mates and all that kind of stuff and do it all again you know, the next week of 40 years, that was an incredibly draining lifestyle for me. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's when I thought to myself, how am I going to get out of this? First and foremost is to get out of that situation because what comes after that is a lot of mental capacity and a lot of ability to think about how to continue building that uh, wealth journey, I guess. Because until you get to a point where you're not burdened by just having to go to work every day and, you know, earning an income to to pay the bills, to pay for the holiday, uh, uh, go out on the weekends to some fancy place or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's just, that's all you can think about, you know. Um, mentally, that's all you can think about. That's all you can do physically because obviously it takes up most of the day. Mm -hmm. So getting yourself to a point where you have the option to not do that, in my experience, has given me a lot of sort of mental clarity to focus on bigger and better things. Obviously, what's important to me as well. And you think it's that order that what actually gives people the option to be able to do it or just takes that option option away completely? I think for me, it, it's just how much you can handle, you know. It, like, it's not, I'm not saying it's not possible to build wealth, you know, by starting a business from scratch. And, mm -hmm. like, for me, I, I've always been very risk-averse. The notion of me, uh, you know, having all these bills and paying for food and rent and all that kind of stuff at the time, uh, and then also starting a business and taking on that risk, uh, was, wasn't was really possible. Okay, because the way that I kind of <coughs> see this is is it also comes down to something that I'm sure it's a term you, you've, you're very familiar with, the double on the double. Whereas if you buy a house for 500000 mm -hmm. and it doubles to a million, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Like you, you're happy days. Yeah. And and let's say that happens over one cycle. That, yeah. And I know the whole seven to 10 year rule, I don't want to get into there to that debate, but let's just say that the market does double every 10 years roughly. Mm -hmm. If you then hold it over 20 years, mm -hmm. that $500,000 house now becomes a $2 million house or going to plan. So it's the double on the double, which is then, well, this this just feels insane now that it's, it's a $2 million property. Mm -hmm. Buying this in an earlier stage of your life mm -hmm. is is going to obviously will then give you a double on a double on a double on a double and, and, and to continue that. Mm -hmm. Whereas that order, if you start investing and go, oh, you know what? We're, we're 45 now. Oh, yeah. Retirement's 15 years away. Mm -hmm. Well, then... That, that order is going to give you a totally different result mm. than if you had to start it earlier. And that's kind of what I was thinking the, the direction was. But you're th thinking of this from also like a, what, a, a business perspective, a, a lifestyle perspective. Like there's a few facets to this for you. Definitely. Look, I mean, I, I never try and rely on hoping that a property doubles or doubles and doubles again and so on. Yeah. Right? Like I've always just focused on different stages, different steps. So the first, very first step for me is get myself to a point where 
my uh, daily income is covered. Okay. Yeah. Enough for me to live off. At that point, I thought to myself, okay, what's what can I do now? You know, I can I can do nothing. I could uh, uh, I could keep working mm-hmm. nine to five. I could uh, work part time. I could start a business. I could uh, you know do spiritually fulfilling endeavors. Mm-hmm. You know that doesn't pay very much. You know, join the Hare Krishnas. Maybe yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thought has crossed my mind. <laughs> Not very good at dancing. But that's probably why I didn't do it. That that's options. That's that's choice. That's what financial freedom is about. Financial freedom isn't about sitting on a beach drinking cocktails. It's really just about you know, giving you the freedom or the ability to really pursue something that's fulfilling to you. Yep. But also rewarding as well. Talk to me about the wrong order then, because I think that, I, and I really want to preface this with uh, a little disclaimer that this isn't the wrong order to live your life. Yep. This is about the wrong order to build wealth. Yeah. So if someone's listening to this going, okay, well, that that is what I really want to do. And chances are you listen to a property investing podcast. It mm-hmm. probably is what you really want to do. Yeah. What's the wrong way to go about it? Look, you know, everyone has different goals, but for me, like if your if your focus is to accumulate wealth through property, mm-hmm. probably the one of the worst things you can do initially is to buy a place to live in. Okay, so no PPR, no PPR. A lot of people are like, you know, the very first thing I want to do is to save up enough money uh, for a deposit for, you know, a two bedroom unit somewhere to get my foot in the door. A couple of reasons for that. Yeah, I was about to say why. The first reason is the very first property that anyone buys to live in statistically, they're unlikely to live in there for longer than five to seven years. Um, and that's because life changes, especially when you're young. You know, we're not even talking about obviously needing to upgrade the house because you have kids and so on. But, you know, you might find a different job. You might relocate. Uh, you might have different relationships with, you know, who you thought you were going to be staying with for a very long time. So all these changes mm-hmm. means that if you're tied down by a property that you paid a lot of money for and obviously have a big mortgage for as well. Mm-hmm. And it's producing no income. You're the one producing the no income. Yep. Not only is it going to set you back financially, but you don't have very many options to be flexible. Okay, because right? now you're going back to the bank saying, hey, we'd like to borrow again maybe and start investing. And they're borrow like, again, you've done that bit. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And you might be thinking, I'm, I want to sell this unit. Uh, because my life circ- circumstances have changed. So you may as well have just rented in the first place. I mean, I'm sure listeners know a lot about rent vesting. Mm-hmm. It's a topic that's been covered uh, many times over. But rent vesting has worked incredibly well for me uh, because it allowed me to save a lot of money and pump that money into investment properties to get myself to a point where the passive income I was earning from these properties covered my rent entirely. And you still do it today? I still do it today. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> like, Because there, there must be people listening going, why is he still rent vesting? Look, I mean, it's for me, it's a bit of a lifestyle thing now. Yep. Uh, look, I'm, I'm property that I'm renting at the moment is vastly different from the property that I first rented I when imagine. I started yeah. on this journey. It's, it's, uh, it's bluntly speaking, it's a lot more expensive. Yep. And, you know, recently I thought uh, in the area that I'm living in, I was going to, uh, I was looking at buying a house, mm-hmm. right? You know, all these houses I was looking at, you know, some were great, some were not so great. And I was looking at the prices I could buy them at. I was thinking to myself, I've got a couple of options. Even if I I were to buy that house with cash, Mm -hmm. pure cash, no loans, anything like that. To live in the same property, if I were to rent that exact property, I could probably live in that property for 40, 50 years with the rent that I'm paying before before I would equal uh, what it would cost to to actually buy the property. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, okay. So the rental cost is a fraction of the ownership cost. Absolutely. So that's number one. If I went down the path of, you know, putting in a massive deposit and getting a massive loan for it, mm-hmm. the interest repayments alone would be more than double the rent that I would pay. Yeah, right. To, to live in the exact same house, you know, same everything. And we're still not talking about council rates, insurances, Forget about maintenance. That. Yeah. That's okay. like that's not even a consideration. Yeah. But not only do I have to pay double the interest. Uh-huh. or triple the interest, I lose that massive chunk of deposit initially. I don't want to say I lose it, but that goes into the house to buy, right? As you deposit your stamp duty, your legals and all that kind of stuff. It's not working as hard for you as it could elsewhere. It's not working at all. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's literally in the house that you're living in. Mm-hmm. The interest you're paying is not deductible, none of that, right? And I, and I thought to myself, if I just spent that deposit amount buying investment properties, let's say I wanted to buy another uh, uh, whatever, however amount of investment properties that I could with that money, the income from that those investment properties alone would be almost covering the entire rent that I'm living in that house. Does that make sense? Yeah, perfect sense. Okay. So like financially, 
whichever way I looked at it, it was a no brainer. So I'm going to rent this property instead. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm going to put my money to work. Right. And also save a bunch of money in the first place. Now, a lot of, a lot of people are, are thinking, oh, you know, if you rent where you live, then, you know, it's really insecure and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I secured a three year lease, the place that I'm currently in at the moment. Mm-hmm. The landlord actually wanted more. You know, I wanted to make sure I, I, I like the place and all that kind of stuff as well. And, you know, so it's the, the notion of all the fear of having to move and that kind of stuff isn't really wasn't really there. <laughs> For you, does this almost come down to the sacrifice component as well, which I feel is a part of the order? Because if you have a bit more sacrifice in the early days mm-hmm. and you order that in the beginning, then the less sacrifice you have to make in the later days. Whereas if you don't sacrifice early, you're going to have to sacrifice later. So if that is maybe one of the sacrifices is the security yeah. of, yeah, maybe we do have to move every, even every year at worst case scenario, but realistically, it's probably going to be more like every like three, four, five years, yeah. which like you've just said, statistically, even if you own the place, you're probably going to move every five to seven years anyway, as an average. Yeah. So I think I mean, it depends on the There's area. There's so many angles, right? Like for me now, moving is a fun thing. No, it's you, not. No, no, it is. It now. actually is. <laughs> because you, you get to experience different a different house, a different location, you know, everything different, right? Like, okay, all right. Like in the past few years, I mean, I've lived in a, quite a, a number of places, but every time that we've moved, we've never been kicked out. It's always been our choice to move. Once or twice of those choices was born out of frustration. Mm-hmm. You know, one time we had a, a, a really bad neighbor that moved in next door. And, you know, we, we didn't like, obviously, what, what the vibe was. Mm-hmm. And uh, Time to leave? Yeah, because you're renting. You have that flexibility. You just up and go. Well, and you think about it from a property investor's point of view. The person that mm-hmm. owns the house isn't going, gee, I hope I go through a different tenant every 12 months. Mm-hmm. Like, it's, it's there's nothing in it for the investor either. Yeah. So. Yeah, you can see it from both sides, but yeah. um, anyway. but rent, rent where you live to begin with. Yep, don't focus on the PPOR just yet or the mm-hmm. owner occupier. Um, What's next? What do what do people normally get wrong next? So they're buying a PPR. That's the mm-hmm. first wrong move from it. Mm-hmm. What's the next order? The next order is spending their money on silly things. You know, I think a lot of people, whether they're renting or buying a property or whatever, you know, I think especially when you're young, everyone's got a. Um, a drive to you know buy fancy things and go on luxury holidays and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not saying you need to not do that entirely, mm-hmm. but just not go over the top. You know what's over the top? Can, can over you the top example? would be if you make a dollar, you spend a dollar. Okay, you know so everything. Basically. Yeah, everything yep. even is over the top for me. Back in the day, was if I made a dollar and I even spent fifty cents on it. You know, so I saved intensely to get the first, second, the third property. Mm-hmm. And we talked about this on a, on a separate episode as well. But delayed gratification. Big time, yep. You know, deliberately put, putting yourself in a position that leaves you wanting for more, right? So, you know, let's say, like I was saying um, uh, in a previous episode as well, like if we're if, we, if you're really into cars, for example, mm-hmm. as like a, a hobby or a passion, deliberately put yourself in a in a car that you dislike driving. Because driving around in that, mm-hmm. even if you can afford something nicer, that won't financially put you backwards. Yep. Just force yourself into that crappy car <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah so that whenever you drive it whenever you're on the streets and seeing other nice cars on the road and all this kind of stuff that you really want it's a reminder for yourself that you're working towards that so it's like a motivator it's a motivator 100 percent. but the real reason why you don't want to spend all this money on, on on stupid stuff is really just so that you can pump it into more investment properties mm-hmm. and uh build your portfolio to a point where you can have that initial milestone of replacing your income enough passive income and then at that point if you really want to smell the roses, go do something that uh, might be a bit silly, that you can buy fancy cars or whatever. Wh- yeah. When would you say is, is the right time to actually know that? So if someone's listening going, okay, well, I've already got two investment properties. Mm-hmm. Like ha- how much longer am I saving for? Is this just proportionate to your end goal? It is, yeah. So have your goals. You know, put numbers around your goals. It's so important. I always say this. You know, people say, oh, wh- I always ask, what's your goal? They're like, oh, I want to I get passive income or I want capital growth. Well, obviously, nobody buys properties to not want capital growth, right? Mm-hmm. But what's the reason behind the passive income goal? What's the reason behind the, the the capital growth? You know, I want passive income so I can quit my day job and follow my passion of becoming a pilot mm-hmm. or follow my passion, or maybe not a pilot. In your case, Todd, you want to fly your own plane, right? Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm just flying for fun. I don't yeah, want to work exactly. as a pilot. Yeah. Totally. So, you know, or whatever you want to do. Like I said, if you want to work for charity, if you want to work for religion, if you want to start your own business. Royal Flying Doctors. Royal Flying Doctors. Yeah. Maybe that's your next calling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this pizza and property thing doesn't work out. <laughs> but you've got to get yourself to a point where you have that, that, that freedom to do that. 
So I always think, you know, as you accumulate properties, figure out how much that's going to take. Mm-hmm. For me, it was a hundred grand. That was exactly what I was earning at the time. So replace my income. Mm-hmm. I gave myself 10 years, a hundred grand, two grand a week, one investment property, 500 bucks a week. That means I need four houses fully paid off. Four houses fully paid off in 10 years equals how many you need to buy investment properties. For me, I needed to buy about 10 properties because as I was buying towards 10, I started selling off a few. The profit I made from those, I started paying off a few. And that's how I ended up with about four houses fully offset or fully paid off that gave me the 100K passive income. So if you need to buy 10 houses in 10 years, that's one a year. So now you get to think, how am I going to consistently buy one a year based on my income, based on my savings, based on my financial situation, based on my uh, risk profile? Mm -hmm. And you can really start to plan out also the parameters of what types of properties you need to buy that's going to enable you to buy one a year for the next 10 years. Doing that really simple exercise is super important before you even think about buying any property. Set down your goals. They don't even need to be accurate. Just a a rough idea on where you feel like you need to be because I can promise you as you accumulate through through the journey to get to 100K, or for me anyway, my goals change Mm -hmm. because I, I learn more, I become more confident, the team around me becomes a lot stronger, my property manager, the solicitor, the the trades, and then everything after that is potential. So, you know, when I got to seven properties, I remember selling off one of the first ones and that's that that was kind of like a a, a a light bulb moment because that kind of showed me that accumulation until that stage is actually unfolding into something productive because as soon as I sold that first house, I had immediately, I think one and a half or two houses fully paid off in Brisbane and that was already giving me about eight, 900 bucks a week of, of passive income, which was a big deal considering I was mm. earning, taking home about, you know, 1,500, two, two grand a week. So that was like, okay, I'm really going to, focus on this now yeah, yeah. and then you think bigger and bigger and bigger and then you get to a certain point you get to your 100k passive and you're thinking you know for me that was a turning point for anyone listening to this as well thinking okay i'm on board with this i don't mind rent vesting i don't mind saving i don't mind actually jumping in on the investing side but my my partner i don't know about that <laughs> rewind back a few episodes uh, i think it was episode 198 for memory uh, is your partner a financial fit and there's a whole lot of different questions you can walk through on that one to to really help out but I, I just wanted to touch on that for you because you and Lynn have been together for, for quite a while. Yes. <laughs> how, how do you feel that comes into it with, with kids, with the family aspect? Again, yeah. like when we're talking about the order of wealth, mm. can you talk to me a little bit about that? Well, this is, is going to be a, a, a very controversial thing because having kids is such an emotional, such a personal journey that you know, everyone undergoes in their own time. Mm-hmm. But you know, for me, consciously I held off having kids until we were at a point where at the very least, you know, we didn't have to work the nine to five. Yep. You know, when you, I mean, I've noticed this obviously after having kids, is it changes you mentally. Mm. A lot of people say the focus, oh, you know, you lose motivation and, you know, all you really want to do is spend time with your kids or, and that's definitely true. Mm-hmm. For me, it, I'm still super motivated to do everything that I want to do, but the focus or the, the why, the reason changes. It's not for you to accumulate more wealth for yourself. It's actually to make their lives easier or make them happier and maybe have a legacy or something and to to carry on into the future and so on. So, you know, it's hard to have that or to provide that if, like I said before, you're burdened by focusing, just putting your food on the table okay. or saving for like the family holiday you so know, to Bali and all this kind of stuff. So, <laughs> I had another I sale lo- the love, other day. I love Bali, yeah. by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not knocking anyone that's going to Bali. <laughs> uh, I'm going in a couple of weeks, mate. Can't wait. Uh, but anyway, that, that's beside the point. Um, so if, if you were going back to the wrong order, yeah. buying a big PPR, or not even a big PPR, just yeah. a PPR yeah. uh, or PPOR, uh, mm-hmm. then we're talking about having uh, no savings, spending pretty much everything that's going on yep. because it's like YOLO. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm only 20 once or yep. in my 20s once. Then not investing at all because I guess you got no savings to invest. Yeah, and throwing kids in the mix there as well. Yeah. So if we're reversing all of this, <coughs> where mm. we're rent vesting, mm. we're saving everything we can within reason as well. Because like you said, you just don't want to like eat baked beans on toast. My words, not yours, but I think I'm <laughs> paraphrasing. I actually like baked beans, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> still eat it now. 
You know, I used <laughs> to actually do that when I was training for, for rides. They were right. the best fuel source. Really? I, I would. It, this is going to sound disgusting, but it worked well. I would drink a can of baked beans okay. because this this is when I was doing like endurance rides, like two hundred kilometers in a day. Right, and it gives you five hundred calories, and it's like the perfect amount of salt, sugar, carbs, and protein. Uh, but anyway, side note. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's what? your that's your that's your orange slice. Yeah, can of baked beans. <laughs> <laughs> you do you talk. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but so if, if we can get onto the, the right order, is there anything else that you feel you look at people, whether they're just people you met, family, clients, whoever it is, and you're like, oh, if you had have actually just done it this way, mate, your story would be so different. I mean, I, look, I don't tr- try to judge other people. You know, different people have their own journeys. For a lot of people, creating wealth is not, not a priority. There's nothing wrong with that, you know. Mm-hmm. But I would say, like, for the people that, are, that I've met that are, you know, really intent on creating wealth, I find they just... It, it comes down to it's not important enough for them. Mm-hmm. That's where you get distracted. That's where you focus your 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 energy. You might like buy one or two properties, and and then you might you know go back to you know spending your money on fancy stuff and all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it really needs to be so strong. It super needs to be a super strong thing that you really want to overcome, or you you need to get to that point because it's just creating such a burden in your life. You know, that's how I felt. Going to work every single day, 6.30, morning, wake up. I'm not a morning, so that was hard enough. And we started this recording at 10 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> putting, on, putting on the same suit, you know, catching the same train with the same people. It was really bizarre to me because I see these people on the train more than I see almost anyone else, but I never know them. I never talk to them. They're all standing on the same platform, you know, same, same, same carriages going to the same place. And it was just an incredibly... Uh, draining experience for me every day and i was reminded every day as to why i was doing this it was to buy my next property so i can i'm one step closer to reaching that goal of not having to do this so that was like how strong my my why or my reason was to get to passive income and uh i I feel like for a lot of people that are kind of wanting that lifestyle they're kind of wanting you know wealth they're kind of wanting financial freedom it 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 rarely happens like that because to, to be honest with you the journey to get there is also not easy it sounds really easy, buy one property a year and buy the right types of property, pull out equity and, you know, cash flow and everything that I keep talking about to buy the next property. Mm-hmm. The reality is also you get a lot of white noise around you. Mm-hmm. The white noise are people telling you, what are you doing? You know, why, uh, wh- why are you buying these houses, you know, around Australia? Why aren't you settling down? Your parents might be giving you a bit, bit of pressure. Um, Especially with some cultural backgrounds. Cultural backgrounds, back 100%, pressure. yeah. yeah. Um, you know, why are you renting? You know, rent money is dead money, you know, for a lot of people that, uh, you know, don't understand the value of rent vesting. Mm. Um, and the white noise, like, uh, from external sources as well, like the media or maybe even experts, property experts telling you should be doing things. But the other thing a lot of people don't realize is buying and owning lots of investment properties is also a mentally and emotionally um, challenging thing to do. I'm not trying to talk anyone out of buying properties or investing in properties. Mm. Expand on that then. What do you mean? A natural part of owning property is tenancy issues and maintenance issues. Yep. Right. Now, when you own one property, you might get a call from the property manager once every couple of months about a leaking tap or mm-hmm. tenants in arrears or the tenants vacating and all this kind of stuff. But as you accumulate more and more houses, this becomes very frequent. Mm. And all you're thinking is like maybe you might even be getting a call once every week or every two weeks. And you're thinking, oh, another thing happened. Or... Um, you know, I have to spend another you know thousand, two thousand dollars to replace a hot water tank or something. I've already replaced two hot water services I'm this a, month. I'm a licensed plumber. Yeah. I haven't <laughs> done any qualifications, but I consider myself a licensed plumber now. <laughs> um, the burden of uh, owning a lot of investment properties is is a uh, is a real thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, really, just about you know overcoming this, and, and that's where a lot of people stop at two or three properties is because they they they're not motivated enough. All they're seeing is all these problems coming through perhaps not realizing that they're actually making money on these properties and they stop because they, they're just like, it's not worth it anymore. Cause you're right. Life doesn't really change unless you sell or withdraw equity. Yeah. So if you're not actually seeing the fruits of it, it's, it's easy to get disenchanted with it. Most of what you experience is negativity, whether it's negativity on the house itself. Is that isn't or is? Is. Is, neg- is okay. negativity. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a world, it's very interesting. I think this is maybe, it might be a thing that's Australian as well. Okay. <laughs> I've noticed as I was accumulating, there was like all, you know, a lot of uh, people around me were extremely uh, negative to the, to the process. Uh, they'll that, say... That you were doing it or the process in general? You're doing the wrong thing. 
Right, okay. You know, you're, over, you're taking too much risk. Do you you're borrowing too much money. Tall poppy at all? Because I think Aussies do sort of suffer from that. Everyone roots for you when you're, the, you're on the ground level, but then as soon as you start getting higher, it's like, oh, Mr. I don't want to say I don't want to say it's tall, tall poppy because as I was accumulating enough properties to quit my day job, I wasn't showy. I wasn't go- going around boasting, oh, you know, I've got, I bought my eighth property or sixth property or whatever. I just pulled out a bunch of equity, this and that. What do you think it was then? I think it's just uh, maybe out of genuine care. You know, people do actually, make, they obviously don't know anything about property investing or maybe they're not have the same goals as you. So especially if it comes from family, mm-hmm. potentially it is like maybe they just want you to be a bit careful and they don't want you to, uh, you know, take on all this risk, you know, for nothing and you're going to end up uh, financially, ruined. Yeah, financially ruined, that type of thing. And then ego, I think, for a lot of people as well. Because mm-hmm. I, I remember as I was buying, buying these properties, a lot of like, you know, well-respected property experts, put it that way, mm-hmm. they were saying, oh, you know, Logan would never go up and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, you're, you're yeah, you know, you're, you're, you're doing the wrong strategy and all this kind of stuff. People you respect and look up to. Uh, so that, that again, is, is always a, a difficult thing. Kind of summarizing this as far as if someone's listening to it going, this has really resonated with me. And especially if, if they are in their earlier 20s <coughs> and they're kind of mapping life out. I'm, I'm feeling that the, the order is rent vest, make sure you're saving as much as possible and keep investing as much <coughs> as you can. Doing it in a balanced way though so you don't stop it either. So I won't go into the beans on toast, but, but <laughs> still, still having a bit of life. Because yeah, it, absolutely. Like, you know, especially if you're young, like you're probably going to be more miserable if you just focus everything you have and all your energy into buying property. If you're young, you have to have fun. Yeah. Well, I can you know, look at Go it on the holidays, uh, go party, do mm-hmm. whatever you need to do. You know, you don't want to waste those years either. Yeah. But it, it's not one or the other. It's not like you, you, you either spend all your money doing that or you spend no money at all and you spend all that money that you save on buying investment property. I remember <coughs> personally where I felt I went wrong when I was in the mines and, and this is the very, very beginning. Before I had anything, I remember we always used to play Goon of Fortune. You ever play that when you were a kid? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Goon of oh, Fortune. <laughs> Spin it. <laughs> and we loved it. You could buy a bag of dirty wine for something like $9 and then all of a sudden when I went to the mines, it was like, oh, I'm not drinking the dirty wine anymore. I want yeah. the Smirnoff Blacks. And I know it's like it's a little thing, yeah. but then it went from – Nine dollars to have silly fun with my friends in my like late teens, early twenties. Yeah. To now it was eighty bucks for a carton or a hundred bucks for a carton, whatever it was. Yeah. It was a lot of those little choices that I personally look back on and went, "Yeah, I went wrong there." Yeah. And it's it's the order that I could have changed because I still could have gone out and had fun. Mm. Still could have just put the bag on the washing line. Like <laughs> Yeah, you can't peg uh, Smirnoff Blacks on the no, on the clothes. Doesn't, <laughs> on the clothes work, like, doesn't really work. Put them in the peg basket. It's or a lot something. of lot of, inj- <laughs> lot of injuries <laughs> will happen. I can almost guarantee it. <laughs> uh, but getting to the pointy end of things here, Simon, is there anything mm. else that you really want to leave people with when they're starting to think about? Because what this really comes down to is is big life decisions, mm. and and when they're starting to think about when it's the right time and maybe when it's time to to put one of those off. Mm-hmm. What do you really want to leave someone with? Look, just. Figure out your goals like really, really intensely to the point where, you know, find out what you want out of life, really. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with going down the normal path, Mm quote-unquote normal path, which is to buy, you know, the the house and the unit and have kids and have lots of fun and spend all your money to uh, really enjoy your your 20s, right? Mm -hmm. But just know that uh, later on in life, in your 30s and 40s and 50s, it's likely that, you know, you'll be working for a lot longer. Mm. like in terms of like a, a job that you potentially may not want to do like i'm probably going to work for the rest of my life right i can't really imagine myself not working because i i don't know i just get too bored you know and uh they say idle times the devil's plaything, right so mm-hmm. <laughs> i feel like especially if you've accumulated wealth and you stop it just opens you up to to doing things that are not going to be healthy for you <laughs> mm. um you know but but then at the same time like for me it's a challenge now you know, for me, it's not necessarily about accumulating more passive income. I, like I've got, I've kind of already um, ticked that box. Mm-hmm. It's about new horizons. It's about doing things that are uh, investing. They're going to make me money, but you know, I enjoy it more, and they're probably more risky. Some stuff that I wouldn't have been able to do before I had passive income, uh, which are things like buying uh, luxury Airbnbs or starting other businesses or indulging in, uh, you know, some of the stuff that I enjoy. Like, you know, I am into cars, so you know, I've bought a few fancy things, you mm-hmm. know, over time. So, you know, I think I think the delayed gratification today has been completely worth it. So worth it. Like just just by 
you know, making a few pivotal pivotal steps when you're early, when you're young. Mm-hmm. Not life changing. Like I said, you don't have to be a complete tight ass with everything and a hermit and not do anything at all. But just um, yeah, just learn to uh, to 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 control it a little bit. All right, mate. Well, wrapping everything up, the the thing that I'm really hearing with this is it's actually a quote, and I can't remember who said it. it was on a Tim Ferriss video. It was uh, when he talks about stoicism. You familiar with stoicism? Uh, yes. <laughs> and it was hard choice, easy life. Easy choice, hard life. Mm-hmm. And I think that this this episode is very much about that. If you can make those hard choices sooner on, then or sooner rather than later, then later on you're going to have that easier life. Mm-hmm. And obviously, the the flip side to that, if not. But for anyone listening that this has really resonated with, Simon, what's an action step for them they can put into practice, like literally right now, pull out their headphones and get started? I actually think most people know already. You know, most people deep down, they know what they want. Okay. They know what's important to them. Yeah. It is really just uh, truly believing in that and working out your goals on how to get there. Okay. You so know, pen and paper, like write it down. Pen and paper, you know, write it down, um, figure out what you're doing or what you have been doing that's not conducive to that goal and how to change it. So like I said, if you are spending all your money on... on, on um, Tim Tams. Tim Tams. <laughs> <laughs> baked beans in your case. Yeah. Um, probably just cut the bake. It's not healthy. It's very salty, Todd. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too much salt. You're riding 200 kilometres, you can eat whatever you want. <laughs> Better than pizza though. I will say that. Oh, now you're off the show, mate. <laughs> <laughs> soon, soon. We're getting there. But yeah, you know, just just figure out like it's as simple as figure out, figuring out what you want, and and don't don't feel like it's like a massive project. Like mm-hmm. I said, it's not. It it doesn't even need to be hundred percent accurate. But at least it's the first step for you to actually click in your ear. Okay, cool. Now I know what I want. I know what I'm doing wrong, or what I should be changing that will be conducive to that goal, and I can start working towards it. Okay, so don't just write down the goals, but write down what you think is actually holding you back or yeah. pulling you off course from them. Absolutely, yeah. I like that. Fantastic. Well, Simon Liu from House Find, I think this is going to be an episode that's going to touch a lot of people, mate, in a very positive way, especially if you actually choose to action the stuff that's in here. Mm. So Simon Liu from House Finder, thank you so much for jumping on the show again, mate. I'm sure we'll see you soon. Great to be here. Thanks, Todd. I really feel like this is an episode that so many people need to hear but won't. And the people that do hear it might not need it. And the people that don't hear it are probably the ones that need it more than anyone. But I think what this all boils down to for me is if if you do what everyone else does, you'll get what everyone else got. That's terrible English. <laughs> if you do what everyone else does, you'll get what everyone else has gotten. It's probably how I should be saying it. But if that's what you want, f- fantastic. Like, go and do it. Debt yourself to the eyeballs when you're 20 with a brand new car. Go and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on your wedding, even though you probably earn 100 grand a year. It's just like all of these things that, to me, it's, it's not about not doing them, but it's about doing them in that order that allows you to actually open up options in life. Because the funny thing that, that I've realized after now meeting so many of the most successful people in real estate investing in the country and becoming friends with a lot of them, that they can stop. They don't want to, but they can. And there's a totally different feeling about not having to go to work. Even myself, being able to walk away from being a real estate agent because of the portfolio that I built and being able to actually go all in with pizza and property. That was an amazing feeling, but I'm not sitting on a beach somewhere. I will be in a couple of weeks going to Bali again, but but otherwise it's like it's having these options and not doing it in the right order will take those options away from you. You will more than likely forever be on someone else's watch, doing what someone else wants you to do, helping someone else fulfill their goals in life. And I know that's not what you want. Otherwise, you wouldn't be listening to this. You'd be listening to This American Life or something else. I don't know. That's the only a true crime podcast, whatever. But right now, you're trying to better yourself. So I think the, the big takeaway that, that I get from this and that I want everyone else listening to get from this is to maybe look at a few of the big life decisions that you're going to make soon, whether they're big life purchases, getting married, things like that. Like Bianca and I, I haven't actually shared this. When we got married, we went, we went to Bali and we did it as a little destination wedding. The entire thing cost less than $10,000 and it was better. I'm just lucky because she was a wedding photographer for almost 14 years. Actually, no, it was 14 odd years. So she'd seen people spend quite literally hundreds of thousands of dollars on their wedding day and not even really enjoy the day. We had an amazing experience, but but we did it in a way that didn't actually stop us from what we were wanting to do. So we still got what we wanted, but we put it in the right order and we did it in the right way. And, and again, the right way for us might not be for you. But anyway, I digress. I want you to think about those next moves and really think about what's going to actually make you happy. Because if it makes you happy and it keeps you on track with your goal, fantastic. If it doesn't, maybe just change the order. Don't never do it. Just change the timeline of when it's done. 
But I really hope you guys have enjoyed this episode. I think we've got a, a very first Unstuck coming up soon as well, which I'm I'm very excited about. So thank you, Simon, Simon for actually sharing these tips, man. Like the, there's a reason that you've you've bought so many properties and the way that you've, again, life has opened up so many options. And if you want to have a bit more of a chat with, with Simon, I was about to call him Shyman, with Simon, <laughs> click the link in the, the show notes below. But right now, guys, that's enough from me. My name is Todd Sloan. This is the Pizza and Property Podcast. And as always, have yourself an amazing rest of the week. Stay awesome.